Hello, and welcome to Fluicell's Capital Markets Day. My name is Philip Lindqvist, and I will be your moderator for the day. If you have any questions, you can submit them through the forms at the right, and we will bring them up at the Q&A session at the end. With that said, I'll leave over to Fluicell's CEO, Victoire Vianney. Please go ahead. Thank you. So before starting, a short disclaimer. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Fluicell Capital Market Day 2023. My name is Victor Vianney. I'm CEO at Fluicell Abbey. We will be online during two hours. Uh, we will do uh, several presentations. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session uh, where you will have the possibility uh, to ask questions. For those who can't stay online during two hours, uh, this session will be recorded and uh, we are going to make the link available to you and you will be also able to download this presentation. So I will kick off this Free Cell Capital Market Day with a statement. So at Free Cell, uh, we aim to bring the power of precision technology to the center of drug development and release the potential of regenerative medicine to transform medicine one cell at a time. And during this presentation, we are going to show you our path to meet this vision. So a quick look at the agenda of the day. After my presentation, I will pass uh, to uh, Dr. Nelson Koo. Uh, Nelson is the Chief Business Development and Sales Officer, and he will be presenting markets and trends. Then Dr. Gavin Jeffries, who is CTO, uh, board member, and founder of FreeCell, will be uh, talking about life science solutions. Then Dr. Tatiana Lobovsky, now Chief Science Officer, will be presenting the regenerative medicine. Back to Gavin Jeffries, who will be presenting the tissue-based drug development models. Then I will have the privilege to do a summary and a takeaway before we start the Q&A session. So at FluiCell, we are targeting key future healthcare challenging, and we are working to provide solutions to address these challenges. So we are working uh, to with, uh, for solutions for tissue-related disease lacking adequate care options, which are causing more than 20 million deaths every year and are a major contributing factor to human suffering and increasing healthcare costs. We are also developing solutions in drug development where 90% of drug candidates fail to pass clinical trials. So there's really a urgent need for better predictive model and improve quick fail at early stage and decrease the pharmaceutical cost. So free cell response to those healthcare challenge is called a 3T, as in technology, tissue-based model, and therapeutics. I'm not going to develop here all these three areas because I'm going to do it a little bit later in my presentation, but very shortly. The first is the research of technology. This is the area where FluiCell is the most known for. Uh, we have been starting as a tech company where we are developing product within single cell and bioprinting. The second T, the therapeutic product, we are uh, working on developing human tissue-based transplant for regenerative medicine. And finally, the third T, the tissue-based model, we are working in to develop human tissue-based disease model for drug development. But let's go back a little bit uh, and look at the history of FluiCell. So FluiCell started in 2012 as a spin-off from Chalmers University of Technology based on one product area. Now, after 11 years of organic uh, development, we have five products on the market. So the first one is BioPen, which was launched in 2012. Then we acquired the product DynaFlow Resolve in 2017, which we recently relaunched in a better version, together with a mini version of the DynaFlow Resolve called the DynaScout. The Biopixlar bioprinting platform was launched in 2019. In 2021, we launched a fourth product called Biozone 6. And finally, in 2022, in Q1 last year, we launched a portable version of our bioprinting platform called Biopixar Air. But FreeCell, it's also a company listed on NASDAQ First North since 2018. It's a company who have several 
uh, ongoing collaboration, either uh, for product development or to develop uh, in vitro uh, tissue models. It's also an uh, impressive regenerative medicine development program where we have made major progress in the production of artificial islets. Fluicel, it's a strong uh, board of director and a very strong uh, team of uh, senior manager, which has been solidified very recently with the recruitment of Dr. Carolina Truclia as chief innovation officer and the recruitment of Joachim Valberg as new CFO, who will be joining us officially on the 1st of July. So Fluicel in number. Behind Fluicel, there is 20 very dedicated and talented employees who are working to deliver excellence. It's five product platform, as I was explaining you, back up by 22 patents and several ongoing patent application. We are targeting three uh, very fast growing business area with double digit CAGR. It's more than 60 installed instruments in 18 countries worldwide. So let's see a little bit of our numbers. Uh, we have been growing uh, until uh, roughly the end of 2021, where we have been hit by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, like a lot of other companies. Uh, but we are back on track on our growth, and we are really well positioned to uh, reach our goal, which is to uh, grow our uh, annual revenue by uh, more than 100%. In Q1 2023, we had 113% in organic sales growth. Now, we, are, uh, we know we even can improve those numbers, and we are not uh, yet where we are aiming to be at, but we are committed to deliver on this growth journey by being cost-effective, and uh, maintaining strong growth margin. So as of today, Fluicel's strategic goal is to mature as life science company through organic growth. It's also to cultivate our position as technology leader within 3D bioprinting. This is what we're doing now. But our aim is also to establish Fluicel bioprinting human tissue as primary choice as research model for pharmaceutical development and medical research. We are also aim at obtaining a position as partner of choice within regenerative medicine and ATMP. So now let's focus back on the three T. Uh, so the first T, the research technology, is our current main source of revenue. This is what I was saying, what FreeCell is mainly known for. So we are developing uh, instruments for uh, drug development and biological research. Uh, all our development are within single cell and uh, bioprinting. And we are committed to develop new products and services to capture a growing market for precision research tool, which is constantly on growth and on movement. We are also refining our uh, business model to increase the revenue through complete solution package and customer brand loyalty through expanded after-sales services. Also, something we are doing is that we are microfluidy experts and we are utilizing this position as microfluidy experts to, uh, to going through collaboration in order to develop more product and consumable for external uh, actors. So the second focus on the second T is the tissue-based disease model. So FluiCell's bioprinting tissue model uh, wish to improve on current standard for in vitro drug testing. As I was saying, there's really a need for better predictive model. And we believe we can add value to drug development through improved predicting power at reduced cost. This is a very important development we are doing, which is targeting increasing demand for non-animal research model as it is pushed right now by both the European Union and the United States. And we are continuing to strengthen our IP portfolio, which is extremely important also to create opportunity for out-licensing. An opportunity for out-licensing within tissue-based disease model 
can count in millions of dollars. And this is a potential we can capture. So the third focus on the therapeutic, uh, also we call the regenerative medicine. So we are currently having a program to uh, develop tissue therapeutic between mainly two areas, which are uh, heart failure and uh, type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, we have ma met a lot of milestones uh, recently, and uh, Tatiana is going to talk more about it in, uh, in her presentation. But diabetic type 1 is an autoimmune disease which is lacking curative solution. And our aim at FluiCell is to develop therapeutic in order to find a curative solution for diabetic type 1. Um, the regenerative medicine program we are doing is within the ATMP. ATMP stands for Advanced Therapy Medicinal Product, and this is representing a new paradigm in medicine. And ATMP Sweden wish to be at the forefront of this paradigm, and they want to encourage many collaboration opportunities between uh, different actors uh, who are acting uh, within the ATMP. And there is example of recent partnership and acquisition agreement who show the increased investment from uh, major pharma companies within ATMP. Uh, I think Nelson is going to talk about and develop this question further in his presentation, but I can mention that recently an agreement was, um, was concluded between Novo Nordisk and bioprinting company uh, Aspect Biosystem with a value of $600 million, exactly to develop uh, therapeutics for diabetes type 1. So this is really a market we would like to capture and an opportunity we have because FluiCell is uniquely positioned to deliver engineered functional therapeutic tissue. So now let's focus on the TO program. So we have an option program we will strike soon in June. I think it's from the 2nd to the 16th of June. And this is an opportunity for investors uh, to uh, support our expansion in our three business area. So how fast we are able to reach our goals depends on investor support until we can reach independency. And we wish really to establish long-term relationship with investors who believe in our long-term program and believe in our potential. And we really believe that together we are stronger and through continued support we can release the potential of regenerative medicine. Now I will finish my presentation with a goal highlight for 2022-2024. These goals have been uh, are written in the prospectus with which we published last year in connection with the right issue. It's targeting four different set of goals within technology development, human in vitro tissue models, regenerative medicine, and finally growing cells and revenue. So already this year, we have been meeting several of these goals, or we have well uh, on track to meet some other goals. So within technology uh, development, we have been um, uh, launching uh, the BioPixar Air last year, and we have been relaunching uh, a new version of the DynaFlow Resolve this year, uh, together with the Dyna, Dyna Scout, meeting the objective that we have uh, this year to, uh, to launch uh, annually a product or a service. We also have been initiating a collaboration with ConScience to develop microfluidic for external actors. We are also finalizing our collaboration with Ion Optics for a product uh, development. We also have been identifying research grants of interest, which we are going to apply to uh, later this year. And we also have the, uh, the goal to expand our IP portfolio. So FluiCell is a very innovative company, and from innovation, uh, of course, come ideas uh, for new patents. So we have identified some of these ideas and we are currently talking to our patent attorney in order to uh, file a new patent application, at least one. New. So within human and in vitro disease model, so this is something we do in collaboration. So we have signed a new uh, agreement with Roche to develop models for cardiovascular safety screening. This new agreement will last from te for 10 
months. And uh, Gavin Jeffries and team has been uh, reaching the first milestone already. So then we have also an ongoing collaboration within the European Union grant uh, from Horizon 2020, which we call BIRDIE, which is to develop human renal models using the bioprinting technology and organ on a ship technology together. So this is ongoing. And all this uh, ongoing uh, collaboration have the potential to lead to uh, some licensing agreements uh, next year, maybe around the end of next year. Then we have the regenerative uh, medicine program, uh, which right now we are developing uh, in, uh, in um, vitro uh, proof of concept with the goal to meet in vivo uh, preclinical studies in uh, 2024, and we are well on track to achieve uh, this goal. Finally, the growing sales and revenue. So as I was explaining, we're expected to continue growth and to meet at least 100% in uh, growth revenue uh, annually. And we are well on track also to achieve this. We are also developing a uh, biopixlar application. This is an important uh, aspect of the work which the cells team is doing because by increasing uh, biopixlar application, we can target more customer. Uh, we have been also strengthening the sales capacity by hiring new people in uh, the sales team and refining completely, uh, cons constantly uh, the uh, sales strategy and uh, the sales pipeline. And I would like to thank you for this presentation and I will pass the uh, presentation to Nelson. Till you say I'm ready. Okay. Hello, my name is Nelson. I came on to Fluicell last year as the Chief Business Development Officer and Sales. And during the last years, we've been looking at a couple of things that's been kind of driving the market. And our, as a result, those trends are now giving us some of the leads that we need for sales. The trends are our population is aging across the world, and that trend is also fueling personalized medicine. Things that people can do that make their lives a lot easier or uh, treat a disease. The cost of uh, drug development uh, has been quite high, and that also propagates the healthcare costs. So the social economic uh, cost is quite uh, substantial for any government or any agencies that are trying to create health services for their community. The advancing specialization, those uh, people that are looking at how do we create a tissue or, or a replacement uh, tissue for the patient, also are becoming more increased in terms of their knowledge and the demands that they want. So that means that we need to kind of address those people in a way that makes sense for them. Um, the drivers across the, uh, the, the world is chronic disease without adequate treatments for diabetes, obesity, liver disease like NASH, neurological diseases, cancer, and cardiovascular diseases. And the development of precision medicine lets us do that. We can take a target cell and then look at what is malfunctioning and then create the change that we need for that. So what we think we can do with uh, the BioPixlar is create tissues that make sense. It's not a mouse, it's human in nature. And that gives us a way to increase the efficiency. We get l a lot higher value data and that data comes in quite early. That means that you can, your product may fail really early and but you can move on to the next one. It also shortens the time for first in human because the data that you get is very precise and is well founded for first test in human. So you don't get that kind of surprise when you go into phase one and you get toxicity levels. And in general, both the EMA and the FDA, two of the largest kind of regulatory agencies, have a harmonized 
standardization rules where they're looking at how do we improve uh, research for diseases and how do we improve the regulatory uh, data they need for getting the uh, compounds into it. And that is now been followed by the FDA with the act to modernize where you don't need animal material only. So alternative uh, material is where we at Fluid Cell are good at. So some of the companies and universities we work with are at the top tier. They're the top universities around the world. They're the top companies around the world. And as you can see, some of them are large companies like Novartis. Some of them are large universities like Cambridge, institutes like Karolinska. So those are our target customers. Those are the ones we go and talk to every day, both for the sales part of instruments, but also for the expertise part where we can produce something that they would need. So going back to the three T areas that uh, Victor Yane had mentioned, we're developing the innovative products targeting growth markets. We're not looking for markets that are well addressed by other technology and, and lower uh, level technology that you can get really fast now. What we're looking at are research solutions based on our instruments and based on a unique uh, perspective on how we measure certain things. So Dynaflow is one of them, Biopixlar. So those are research solutions. That market space is about seven billion and is growing at a double digit, about 15% per year. Now we go back, that supports what we can do with therapeutics. That's a $20 billion market. It's already a threefold increase and it's growing at 20%. So you can see that the markets we're attacking are quite substantial, but they're also quite demanding in the sense that the people are there, again, are experienced, and they are demanding more than just the surface uh, kind of uh, data or the surface uh, details. But that also supports now our bio-relevant human models. We know that uh, drug co companies that are developing drugs tend to have failures late stage or before they get into the first inhuman application. That failure costs you a lot of money. And I'll talk about that in, in after I talk to you about some of the uh, platforms we have. What we think we can do, we started with the BioPan Biozone platform. That's kind of the, the linchpin for all our, our development since then. Dynaflow, the microfluidics, and then BioPixel to be able to not only deliver compounds, but we also deliver cells now, particles. And that gives us a way to create unique tissues. Tissues like a liver tissue or a kidney tissue, which Gavin will talk about. And that gives us a way to test the drugs that we have in a toxicity platform, in the sense that we can take a liver tissue and maybe a, a kidney tissue and look at what a, what's gonna happen with that drug to those tissues. It may work really well for the liver, but as a result, the kidney is failing. So those then gives you a, a way to say go, no go, and your tissues uh, development and the drug development. So 3D bioprinting in general uh, has been pretty well critically looked at as just additive bioprinting. In this case, they use kind of delivering uh, material to put cells on top of another cells or on top of surfaces. In our case, we use the cells themselves to build the structure. So there's nothing intervening or interfering with that cell-to-cell -cell interaction, and that's very unique. If you have something intervening, that means the cells can't interact with the neighboring cells, it takes them longer, and as a result, then you don't get the same type of uh, development of that tissue rapidly. So overall, 50% of the market right now is the US because they jump on the on the boat very fast, or the bandwagon, and then everybody else follows. The result of that is that if we focus only in the US, we're going, oh wow, that's really a saturated market. But the rest of the world is still there. So countries like China, Australia, Japan are all delivering on trying to get regenerative medicine. Countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore are also trying to get on that. So there are a lot of customers and a lot of potential partners that we can get out of this. Um, so just go, go back a little bit about drug development. It's usually now priced around $2 billion to take a drug from its test tube in the lab to the 
to the drug being used in a patient. And that also then also increases the price of, uh, of your drug. And that is where we think we can make the difference. The 10-year average is based on very sequential steps, animal studies that look like they work, you know, uh, a hepatitis drug that worked in dogs but failed in human. They didn't notice that there was an enzyme difference between the two. And that makes a difference when you're developing drugs. So as you can see, there's maybe 11,000 drugs that uh, compounds that are testing preclinically in the lab, in either in R&D in uh, the company. But by the time it gets launched, that's only about 1%, one, or one percent, or even less. So you can see where all the drug failures are coming in and where we need a better model, a model that mimics that that occurs in the human. So one of those things is the drug toxicity profile. So we need to figure out whether the drug is causing toxicity in the neurons, in the liver, in your skin, in your eye, and that can only be tested either in an animal, which is a poor proxy, or in humans, which is not allowed. So you need to use a, a surrogate tissue for that. In this case, what we at Fluid Cell can do is create those tissues so you make those tests. And those tissues can be of different organs. So essentially, a human on the chip, eventually. So cardio, cardiac toxicity market is quite large. It was 18 billion in 2022. That was just last year. It's expected to grow to about 35 billion. And that is conservative. That's based on if things work th that are being predicted works well. If things work better, that numbers will really increase. So we think, for example, if you're looking at just a um, electrical activity test, whether the channels are opening or, or closing, is essentially a gate, then that's already 35% of the market. But that test is not the only test that can be done. So we have a market space where we can enter as well. So using the Dynaflow, we can make those measurements. And that's basically what we think will happen. What we also think will happen is that regenerative market will be a huge market in the sense that it's already targeted to be about 60 billion by 2027. That's four years from now. And it's growing at about 18% per year. So that's a large growth. So it's like one in every five, kind of multiple each year. So what that's, that means is that the recent deals between pharma and biotech are going to increase. There are going to be demands on those deals. There's going to be demands on sales. There's going to be demand on business development for collaborations and, and new partnerships. What we've seen in the, just the last six months is that Vertex bought Viaset because they wanted a particular uh, cell uh, uh, platform that they had. Aspect that Biosystem and Nova Nordis agreed because they had a good idea of to move forward what already Novo is doing with stem cells. Dewpoint was bought, uh, went into an agreement with Novo Nordis, and it's also a huge agreement. So we can see the potential, and that's what we at sales and business development are going to try to grab and exercise. So we want to be a participatory company in those events. Thank you, that's all. Next. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Nelson, for for explaining all that. It was very, it was very good. So, uh, I will switch sides. So, hi there. So, my name is uh, Gavin Jeffries. Uh, so, I'm the CTO and founder of Fluicell. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, I get the opportunity to show you today is a a, a little brief introduction to some of the technology that, that is actually behind all of these things that you've heard about. Kind of a little glimpse behind the curtain of what makes all of these things possible. We'll try not to go into too many technical details, just to give a nice overview of what is possible with Fluicell's portfolio. So one of the things we like to say for Fluicell portfolio is it's more of a lab on a tip uh, uh, solution. So we have here, we show actually five different areas in which we have these technologies put. We have the BioPen, as, as we've heard, uh, especially from, from Victoire. This was one of the founding products of Fluicell. Uh, we have the Dynaflow Resolve, which 
Fluzel acquired the license technology for. And then the, the later three products, the BioZone, the BioPixel, and the BioPixel Air, are all in-house developed products. This platform of, of uh, different products actually gives us one unified family. So one set of tools in which we can actually interrogate biology, but not only at the single cell level, but actually at the tissue level now. We've migrated from our ability to just deliver small compounds to individual cells, to large groups of cells, to now with Biopix and Biopix Air, we can actually build tissues with, with these uh, fluidics. I'm now going to step through a little bit and to give you a little idea of what, how we do this. So the ethos behind all of these products and the ethos behind Lab on a Tip in general is we're delivering what we want, where we want, uh, uh, and exactly when we want. And, and this is not only to do with, with the compounds, but it's also now to do with the cells. The little picture that we see on the screen here is actually uh, one of our devices. This is actually uh, one of the BioPen devices. And we can see here all of these micro channels. This is a very zoomed in magnified image whereby we can see all of these channels coming to a, a point. And this allows us and gives us this ability to control exactly liquids at this level. So as I described, we want to tell you a little bit about what each of these products does. So we have here a group them together, uh, essentially one technology, but actually with two products. So we have the BioPen and the BioZone 6. So these two products together allow us to deliver compounds to individual or groups of cells. Very important for both fundamental research as well as for pharmaceutical drug development. So this allows us to <laughs> Um, target individual cells with the fluidics uh, but by uh, exposing one or a few cells, not only just with one pump compound, but with multiple. And we can do this in sequence without contaminating the surrounding solution. Um, this is a very unique ability of this uh, type of device that we created and that we generated. Uh, and we do this uh, with very low compound consumption. So one of the things that we want to be able to do is have all of these capabilities, have this targeted solution delivery on cells and using chemicals, using things which are very expensive or rare. And this requires the, this idea of using very small volumes. All of our technology is microfluidic in nature, which allows us to use very small volumes. In fact, our typical delivery ratio is in the nanoliters per second, which is uh, significantly below what you would normally uh, see in biological experiments. Now, just to give an idea of what this looks like in practice, um, uh, the BioPen has, in fact, a uh, particular example here, which we'll, we'll see on the screen. I, I think it may be even looping, is we have a mosquito stylet. This big needle that we see on the screen is actually a mosquito st a stylet, which is a, a feeding needle, which was extracted from a mosquito. The neurons have been particularly labeled. And this little half moon thing we see to the side is actually whole blood. So this whole blood is being, de being delivered by the biopen to just the very tip of this stylet. When the stylet senses this, this whole blood, we see the neurons activate and we see them all change in color. And this type of experimentation, this type of research is really at the cutting edge of, of what can be done at this size scale. So you can study fast processes. You can study processes with sub-second exchange time of liquids. So not only do we have to be dependent on changing the liquid in a beaker or in a petri dish, but we can actually do this now at the size scale that biology actually oper operates on, which is at a single cell level. This whole platform, particularly the BioPen, that we founded on, our ethos was that we're trying to empower research. We want to be able to give researchers the power of microfluidics. So this had to be easy to use. It has to be easy to implement, and that's something that we can offer. Um, so this easy implementation, easy user interface, while able to do very complex experimentation, really captures what the BioPen has at its very core. BioZone 6 was an expansion on this idea. The BioPen uh, really focused on the academic market. We really wanted to focus on how can we empower researchers with this kind of new cutting edge uh, solution delivery. The BioZone 6 expanded on that and saw, okay, how is this used in, in pharmaceutical workflows? How can we expand on what we've already developed and already have in very prestigious universities, as Nelson was showing, to actually start to capture some more of the pharmaceutical workflows? 
in doing so, one of the things that we did was we expanded our range from doing not only four solutions to six solutions, hence the name. We also built in multiple levels of uh, protocol repeatability so that you can repeat the same experiment time after time after time with sub-second resolution and very high precision while capturing and maintaining this low compound consumption. A lot of the pharma industry, particularly in the uh, discovery phases, uses very expensive or synthesized compounds, which really demand very low, uh, low solution uh, uh, volumes to be used. Taking a little sidestep now. Um, uh, so we've heard a little bit on the biopen. We've heard a little bit on the biozone. Um, Biopixlr and Biopixlr Air, we're going to group together a little bit here because these are two platforms built using the same technology. So the Biopixlr Air, as Victoire was saying, was, was a more portableized version, something that we designed to fit a little bit more into workflows where there's a restricted environment or where you need to have a very strict, very strong control over the environment, i.e. putting it in some sort of biosafety cabinet. So the Biopixlr and the Biopixlr Air essentially are what we coin as a, a leading bioprinting technology. We're the only technology which is able to use bioprinting with the cells in their native liquid environment. We don't use any sort of binding matrix. We don't use any sort of uh, templating structure. We print directly from cells into solution onto whatever substrate or surface that we is required for that particular application. Um, what this allows is this allows dynamic, interactive, custom patterning of biological tissues. We can use a template from biology. We can, in fact, improve upon templates that biology has already given to us. So we can look at histology examples. Uh, we can look at actual biopsies and things and actually see how things have been developed and how can we, uh, how can we replicate those, those designs uh, in, in tissue that we print. As it's describing here, we do this always in our native, uh, native cell media without any binding matrix. This is very important. I think Victoire was, was also bringing this point to a, to a forefront uh, by mentioning we really need to uh, study biology with the cell-to-cell -cell interactions and the microenvironment intact. The only way that we can do this currently is to keep the cells in as native and exposed area as possible. So we, we really want to keep them in this liquid. Um, but also, cellular structures are, are multi-cell types. So the Biopixlr is able to have multi-cell types printed into its, uh, uh, in loaded into its uh, printhead, so we can use multiple cell types simultaneously within the same printing architecture. As we are a microfluidics company, at our core uh, that has now developed and, and, and advanced into these more platform and tissue development fields, uh, we still have our microfluidics expertise at our core. We still have this understanding, knowledge, and know-how on how to handle liquids, and in this case, how do we handle um, uh, suspension. So cells suspended in a liquid have very, very uh, low volumes and at very low uh, um, uh, like flow speeds. So these low volumes and low flow speeds allow us to maintain our cell viability and use very small amounts of material, uh, which is particularly important when we start to consider personalized medicine as one of the application fields. I'll transition a little bit here to, to one of the uh, uh, recent users of the instrument in that it's been really uh, starting to get uh, interest from the field as um, Dr. Carl Asmota, uh, who's from uh, Marsic University, really points out is that what the Biopixlr can offer is one of the missing links which we've been seeing in the bioprinting space going forwards. Bioprinting is an amazing field. It's got many different moieties, many different ways of achieving uh, this uh, replication of biology. But one thing which, up to the point of the Biopixlr coming out, was uh, that the microenvironment wasn't really um, uh, at the focus, whereas we really try to have the microenvironment at its focus, which allows you to study these vital roles of cell-to-cell -cell communication and the cell-material interaction. Um, so what I've been describing so far uh, has a tendency to, to sound a little bit science fiction, a little bit kind of out there. So um, uh, sometimes it's nice to show a little bit on what it actually is. So here's a very simplified, here's a very simplified example on what we actually have here. So the, uh, what I'm going to show is a very short clip on exactly how the Biopixlr does its printing. So I'll start this video, hopefully. Yeah, so here we have it. Um, so what we see here at the bottom of the screen is the printhead, and all these little spheres are actually the cells. So these are human skin cells. Uh, so we print this stripe. So once this is established, once you've got the desire that you want, the cell type was switched. 
now we're implanting skin tumor cells into this model. So now we've got our stripe of, of skin cells, now some tumor cells. Now we're going to switch back to skin cells and we'll keep printing. Uh, what this real-time uh, uh, switching and real-time printing allows us to be able to do is uh, have interaction with the sample. You can create uh, the uh, model that you want in real-time. Um, uh, you can have programmed the Biopixel and the Biopixel Air are designed to have a programmed interface. You can design your tissue uh, or you can directly interact actually with a little gamepad so that you can modify your tissues on the fly and you can increase your, your uh, user experience when you're generating these tissues. Um, so the Biopixel, as I was mentioning, isn't on its own. It's, there's, a, there's a large space for bioprinting. Bioprinting has many different technological bases. Here we just list just a few of the most common ones, being extrusion, where we're just uh, using a gel, which is coming out of a nozzle, stereolithography, which is using light or lasers to project a pattern, Inkjet printing, which forms droplets with cells in, and laser-assisted, where you're actually using lasers to ablate a support matrix from a surface. And here, uh, and it later on, I'm sure you can pause and see how all of these different parameters kind of lay out. But here, we're really describing the capabilities and the differences between each of these approaches. Um, the Biopixel really focuses, as you can probably see, on this idea of low stress, uh, on the printing resolution, small volumes, small sample usage, cell-to-cell -cell interactions. This is the core of what the Biopixel is about. Um, uh, and we can see that from this type of chart. Now, what this really uh, leads us to is our ability to make custom tissues. So um, one of the things that we, we really have a focus on here at FluCell is trying to replicate biology as close as we can. Uh, tissues, as have been said by both Victoire and Nelson, are be both being utilized now within pharmaceutical workflows all the way from the discovery side uh, through uh, the advanced uh, uh, kind of more testing phases. Uh, and at FluCell, we're able to actually regenerate some of these structures. So I have a couple of just very quick examples here whereby we can generate complex assays specifically for tumor development, uh, uh, both of these being uh, liver tissue examples, actually, uh, where you can study cell-to-cell -cell interaction as well as their larger scale 3D uh, uh, makeup. Um, Staying within this cancer field, we also have uh, uh, one of our particularly uh, strong collaborators at the Knight Institute uh, in, in Oregon, which is Dr. Luis Bertazzoni. Um, now, their uh, particular interaction is really at the single cell level, understanding how tumors uh, grow, how tumors communicate, and how they actually invade tissues. So one of the things they're using um, uh, this particular uh, technology for is very high precision, single cell positioning, every single tumor cell where they want it within this larger matrix. And they can do this with high speed and high reproducibility so that they can replicate it to the best of their ability and extract the maximum amount of data from their experimentation. And with that, I will thank you for the attention and hand over to my colleague, Tanya. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, hello, and um, well, my name is Tanya Lobovkina. I am the CEO of the company. I have been with, with Lewis Cells since 2018, and today I'm going to tell you about our regenerative medicine program, a program at Fluis Cell with the main focus on type 1 diabetes area. In our pursuit of leadership in regenerative medicine, we are striving to establish a leadership, uh, we are striving to, <laughs> sorry, uh, we are striving to establish leadership in a new niche of regenerative uh, medicine through our game-changing uh, innovative uh, technology. And we are leveraging our high-precision Biopixler platform to develop and produce and tailor organ-restoring tissues. We target therapeutic areas where underlying cause of the disease is um, tissue damage and where we have large unmet uh, medical needs. Our vision extends beyond, uh, uh, beyond uh, scientific advancements. We also want to be a choice of partner for advanced ad for ATMP development. And in line with Fluid Cells vision, our one of our key focus areas is type 1 diabetes. It's a lifelong chronic condition uh, for which we do not have uh, curative uh, options. So fluid cells vision is to transform how we treat type 1 diabetes using bioprinted tissue therapeutics 
and our goal is to provide patient-tailored artificial pancreatic islets for glycemic control. Type 1 diabetes is a growing medical concern with a huge annual global cost burdens. And even though we have, uh, there is uh, insulin-based treatments, very often patients with type 1 diabetes face um, challenges in their health and uh, well-being. So there is an urgent need for new approaches uh, and optional treatments. And in this, uh, uh, as, uh, for cell therapies uh, for better cell replacement and pancreatic uh, islet replacement are considered to be most important and factful and cost-reducing future treatment options. So FluiCell develops unique type 1 diabetes treatment uh, concept based on bioprinted artificial islets and we envision full glycemic control without the need for immunosuppressants for the patients. So since the beginning of the year we have been hitting uh, important uh, milestones and goals in development of bioprinted islet by printed artificial islets, and our uh, next milestone would be to enter in vivo preclinical studies in 2024. So these are just some numbers that emphasize the importance of, importance of the disease. So there are millions of uh, adults and children affected by the disease worldwide. There are hundreds of thousands deaths uh, and a huge economic burden which is projected to increase. So type 1 diabetes is a long-life autoimmune disease in which pancreas does not make insulin or makes it very little. In healthy, in healthy pancreas, you can find small islands of cells producing hormones that regulate blood glucose levels. They are called pancreatic islets. They are very small. They are tens to hundreds micrometers of diameter. And among... Uh, different uh, hormone producing cells, alpha cells and beta cells are of, uh, uh, of importance. Beta cells are insulin secreting cells that uh, regulate blood glucose levels and alpha cells they are glucagon secreting uh, uh, cells that secrete glucagon which helps to maintain healthy blood glucose levels, they help against hypoglycemia and they also affect functioning of beta cells. Um, Pancreatic islets are also vascularized and innervated and uh, we place our focus on endothelial cells which are um, building blocks of uh, capillary vessels of pancreatic uh, islets and they're helping with um, functioning of beta cells and hormone producing cells. So um, in type 1 diabetes, uh, beta cells are destroyed and uh, pancreas cannot produce uh, insulin in response to glucose. And at Fluid Cell, we have a goal to develop artificial islets capable of replicating uh, glucose, uh, um, capable of replicating insulin secreting function of the pancreas. And we envision, um, we envision achieving glycemic control without the need of immunosuppressants. So our artificial islands, which are essentially bioprinted uh, microtissues, uh, we create them directly from cell suspension, enabling high precision um, single cell level control over islet size, cell to cell ratio, islet density, microenvironment composition, all of which can be tailored to the needs of patients. Our development target is to replicate unique codependent interactions between alpha and beta cells through microtissue tailoring for improved tissue survivability and functionality. So in this example, for demonstration purpose, we uh, took uh, mice pancreatic cells, we loaded them into the uh, bioprinter pr print head, we took alpha, beta, but also endothelial cells, we combine them in the ratios that mimic cell-to-cell uh, uh, -cell ratio in pancreatic islets, and here we can show how, here this example shows how these bioprinted islets can be generated and uh, you can really see that they are printed pretty much cell by cell and with a very high precision. We can create uh, islets, we can create uh, arrays of such islets and this, uh, the size of these islets is mimicking the size of native pancreatic islets. So creating artificial islets is not just enough for developing successful therapeutics. We also have to protect these bioprinted uh, artificial islets from um, 
immune system of the host organism. And one way of doing it is to combine uh, these uh, eyelids, artificial eyelids by, uh, with hydrogel materials. So we essentially embed them into hydrogel materials, which are semi-permeable materials that allow for the diffusion of oxygen, nutrients, and also insulin. So this example shows a, um, such a construct where uh, artificial eyelids are embedded between two thin layers of hydrogel. We refer to such construct, construct as a biocomposite. And um, what we want to do is to see how functional those artificial eyelids and biocomposites are. And why one way of doing it is to expose them to different glucose concentration and see whether they would uh, uh, secrete insulin in response to glucose in a manner similar to uh, how it happens in native pancreatic eyelids. And yes, we can see that artificial eyelids are responsive to glucose stimulation by secreting uh, elevated uh, insulin. We also wanted to infer the viability of the eyelids and uh, what we did, we took fluorescent dye that can enter into the uh, live cells and we used these dyes, uh, we exposed eyelids uh, to this dye uh, on at, uh, after one week after bi-printing and then we can see and in the image you can see it's green, green clusters of cells, they are alive and we are quite happy about it. We also recently discovered that uh, eyelids on the on uh, after three weeks of uh, grow of, of incubation and development, they are also alive and that makes them very promising for future um, studies and uh, long-term investigations. So now I would like to summarize and give you the key features of our artificial eyelids and biocomposites. They contain key and uh, essential cell types, alpha, beta, and also endothelial cells. Their size is similar to the size of native pancreatic eyelids. They respond to glucose stimulation. They are protected between uh, layers of hydrogel. They are functional over a prolonged period of time, at least for three weeks. They recently, we have also shown that we can produce them in quantities that is sufficient for in vivo testing. And the last but not least, they are easy to release from the production site uh, with minimal post-processing. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and pass a word to my colleague. Gavin? Thank you, Tanya. Um, so, welcome again. Uh, uh, so, I won't introduce myself so much this time, uh, but my name is Gavin Jeffries. And what I would like to, you know, uh, transition to a little bit more now is we've described a little bit about the technology. So that we've we've got in, uh, in the bag now. Um, Tanya has, has very well described the therapeutic use of some of our, our bioprinted tissues and the programs in which we have made significant strides uh, towards uh, developing. What, but therapeutics isn't the only uh, direction in which flu cell takes with regards to the tissue development. Um, there's also a very vast uh, area and a vast field where tissues, uh, specifically uh, you know, uh, disease models for tissues, actually play a major role within the pharmaceutical uh, pipeline both uh, within academia and uh, within industry. Um, so I, uh, as uh, Nelson was very eloquently describing a little bit earlier, is um, uh, drug development's a long process. Um, this generally takes a very long time, and very few uh, drugs actually pass uh, early to mid-stage uh, development. Um, it's a very much of a start with a lot of things, finish with a, a few right at the very end. Um, and one of the most important things to be able to do is fail as fast as possible. So what we want to be able to do in this regard is stop uh, the, the failure at the mid-stage, but fail right at the very start. Um, and one way that this may be possible and one direction in which uh, we are taking is can we develop disease models using human tissue so that these can be tested on early on in the process. Um, uh, now, it's quite well known that existing cell-based or single-cell uh, uh, culture dishes and things and animal models have limitations in their application. They're very good, they, they can give a lot of data, but as, um, uh, as legislation changes and as uh, we develop more in our understanding of cell-to-cell -cell behaviors, um, there's a greater focus on can we have a humanized way of testing these drugs? Can we, in fact, engineer tissues which better replicate the human uh, uh, 
uh, or human tissue or human organ. Um, uh, this has both the benefit of speeding up the failure rate. You will see the safety toxicology and safety pharmacology earlier on in the process uh, while simultaneously removing uh, this uh, ethics issue and, and, and more challenging uh, uh, work of uh, working with laboratory animals. Um, so uh, the a few years ago, uh, the recent publication uh, came out uh, called the Bioprinting Roadmap, which which quite well described uh, the various steps which are needed in taking uh, bioprinting from where it was at the start, which was more of a conceptual uh, technology, a new technology coming out, where it would be required to go uh, so that we could actually start using this for therapeutics, as Tanya was outlining, or for it using it in in vivo models, or in fact, pharmaceutical safety testing. Um, one thing that uh, we can see, as we outline here, is that the focus really at the later stages shifts from how can we organize uh, these structures? How can we build scaffolds? How can we have things which are biocompatible? To now transitioning more to how can we monitor these cell-to-cell -cell interactions? How can we better replicate how biology works? Um, and from that, what we can see is that Biopixlet actually already is jumping in at these very late stages. We already can assemble cells very close to each other. We can modify the local um, uh, environment we can uh, structure and tune the cell-to-cell -cell ratios between things, and we can already start building these organoids and spheroid systems, which are seen as more advanced models for uh, humanized tissues. So the bioprinting roadmap is kind of giving us an idea that we're on the right track. This, this way of building tissues that we're really putting our energy and really focusing on, in fact, mirrors uh, what is being replicated uh, from the academic uh, industries. One of the things which is very important, as we can see a little bit here, is we also need to have high reproducibility. Making one or two of these structures is not enough. If you need to be able to compare how tissues respond, we must be able to make uh, similar replications using cell-to-cell -cell, uh, organization and ratios. And also, uh, there's the sheer number, so that high resolution uh, matters, cell-to-cell -cell ratios matter, organization matters, all of these things play pivotal roles in the construction of, of customized tissues. And these are all things which can be uh, now implemented using the Biopixler platform. Um, within uh, FluCell, we try to focus our efforts in a, in a couple of particular areas, one being uh, uh, cardiac or cardiac uh, safety toxicology, and the other being in, uh, in the renal work or the kidney, uh, uh, kidney models. So uh, I'll first of all look uh, primarily at the cardiac uh, area, but if we look at generally, uh, current literature shows that most um, uh, most heart models, so most models that we have today uh, for humanized uh, in vitro um, uh, models use cardiomyocytes. These cardiomyocytes uh, or heart cells are typically from uh, uh, stem cells, so iPSCs which have been differentiated to form uh, cardiac cells or very simplified mixtures of cardiac cells with another cell. However, one of the things which we know from, from studying, uh, uh, studying uh, uh, cardiac and, and heart uh, in actual living creatures is that only about 77% of the heart is actually cardiac cells. We actually have a large composition of other cells, actually. Um, and it's not a randomized mixture. There is structure. There is order to our biological um, uh, nature. Uh, and this is something that we need to start trying to replicate within our model systems. So monocultures um, uh, or single cell type cultures give a glimpse into the idea of how the cells will respond but it only gives part of the picture um, what we at FluCell uh, want to try to be able to do is can we build a better uh, a version of this can we structure and can we pattern these cells into an organization which better resembles biology so here we have a couple of things of where we would call the the need for the advanced cardiac models so you need to replicate the complex microenvironment. The, the cardiomyocytes and the cardiac cells don't just see other cardiac cells. They see endothelial cells. They see perivascular cells. They see fibroblasts. This is something which is, is we try to capture in the models that we're generating. Um, we need to replicate these roles uh, specifically so that the, uh, each of the cells has different levels of excretion into the system. And we need to also not only look at how one cell will respond to the toxic environment, or the stress, for example, if we're, if we're testing a stress model. Uh, but how does this occur in general? How does it occur as a whole? And this is something which requires a more complex model to capture. Um, 
this model needs to be uh, essentially more refined, more physiological in its nature. But then we tack key on to the last point, which really sets it aside from other animal models, is that um, one of the things that uh, the, the field in general is trying to capture, and something that Fluicell really focuses on, is how do we quality control these models? How do we replicate something time after time after time again? We need to do this at the cellular level. We can't do this from a macroscopic and then a, uh, essentially a, a scaled down version. We need to build from the small building blocks so that we can generate multiple identical models so that when we test with pharmaceuticals, when we test with stress agents, we get repeatable results and we get results that people can actually make decisions on. Uh, so this is our goal and this is something behind how we establish our tissue models. Now, as we were saying, we focus uh, primarily on two areas with influenza, one big one it being the cardiac model development. Um, but what one of the biggest areas that we're trying to um, uh, develop tissue specifically for is for safety toxicology. So if we look at the vast majority of pharmaceuticals which go on the market, these all have to be tested in different, different ways. But one key way that they have to be tested, one important way, is to make sure it doesn't hurt other things. And one of the organs which it has to be tested against is the heart. It's very important that whatever you're doing needs to be tested against the heart. Um, and to do that, you might need an animal model or something in that reserve. What we want to essentially establish is a cardiac um, safety toxicology model, which is a humanized uh, replication. So you can get those first screens, those first toxicology and safety screens done on a very, uh, uh, very repeatable, very complex humanized model early on uh, so that we can look and see, okay, is this platform something which is going to be able to go forward? Is this compound something we can take forward? Or do we need to further establish an even more complex model? So as, as Victoire was saying, uh, uh, so far um, uh, we've had multiple collaborations, one of which uh, was uh, specifically with Roche, where um, we actually are within the uh, safety uh, toxicology field, whereby we wanted to uh, have a first pilot study with them. So our first pilot study was um, uh, to see can the workflow, can uh, uh, fluid cells bioprinting approach generate cardiac in vitro tissues which are possible to be integrated into uh, the workflows of safety pharmacology. Um, so we started this work in, in 2020 and, and finished it a couple of years later, um, successfully showing and demonstrating on all milestones that yes, we can establish a more complex model which uh, would fit directly into a, a safety tox uh, workflow. Uh, this year, uh, we actually issued a follow-up study to actually take this to the next level, where we actually investigate the feasibility of having these printed tissues into existing workflows. Pharmaceutical companies, like all large uh, companies, have established workflows, and what we want to be able to do is add and not replace. We want to be able to have take our role, take our place, within these workflows without people needing to make all of these additional changes to try to fit into your workflow. We want to adapt to fit into theirs. Um, so the current feasibility is to see, can we now develop tissues not only to replicate the, the cardiac function, but to do this in a way which actually will fit directly into their pipeline. So this can be seen as a viable replacement for the current technologies which are used. Um, just to give an idea uh, of the numbers associated with this um, uh, and, and to give a, a bit of a, a scope, um, uh, one of the things that we're aiming uh, to look at is not only the safety screening services that, that Nelson was, was talking about with these very large growth areas and, and large price tags, but also within the toxicology screening. Um, as I was alluding to, a lot of the compounds which are generated, as they should be, have to be tested against human uh, tissues, human organs, one of the critical ones being the heart. And this is a very large area in which we, we aim to be able to generate tissues and licenses so that other people can use uh, these advanced models that we generate. And with that, I will hand over to Victoire, or I'll stand still and, and Victoire will come in. <laughs> Maybe you can stay here, Yevin, since we will have the Q&A session after. Absolutely, absolutely. So very shortly, a uh, take-home message. So I think it was extremely interesting to listen to my colleague who has been uh, now talking uh, during, I don't know what time it is, but it's been a while, <laughs> a while uh, that we have started uh, to uh, this presentation. And 
I hope that we have been convincing you uh, that free cell is on the right track and everybody is really uh, dedicated in their work and to advance what we wish to achieve. And as we advance in our three business areas, which are the three T, I will repeat them, the research technology, the tissue based uh, disease model, and uh, the tissue therapeutic or regenerative medicine. And we, meet, we are meeting the goal actually that we have been communicating in the prospectus, which was published last year. So we already have certain goals which has been met, some goals which are ongoing, but which are on the right track to be met. And some goals are for 2024. So mm. of course we haven't reached them yet, but we are on the Normal. right development mm -hmm. in order to really meet them in 2024. And all these areas represent rapidly growing markets and this uh, Nelson has been uh, talking a lot about the market potential where Fluissel has the ability to deliver a key advantage and make really a societal impact. And some of the important advances we have planned uh, for this year are expected to give results as I was saying in 2024. Mm -hmm. And we are going, I think, to start now the Q&A session. Mm -hmm. um, and Tanya is going to join us for the Q&A session. She is. Yeah. We can go like this. Yes. Thank you. Dun, dun, dun. Which Thank you for that very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, now over to the Q&A session. We can start off by Gavin. Sure. The product portfolio has many interesting and useful applications, both for academia and industry, as Gavin nicely explained. Uh, why do you think that they are not selling that well, even though some of them being on the market for years? Mm -hmm. So, you want me to take this one? Take so, it. it's true that some, oh, some has been on the market for years. It's a case for uh, Biopen, for example. Uh, Regarding Biopixar, it's not that long. Uh, we, we launched it in November 2019, just before the global pandemic, mm. so which has been a little bit raising all the, uh, the efforts uh, which we were willing to make in order to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, show, to showcase uh, the Biopixar. What is important for investors to understand is that all our products are innovative which means that there is no direct competition for the type of product that we are making because we are not trying to duplicate what the other one are doing. We are really are a true innovation company and we are making a product that are doing things that other product cannot achieve. Now this is very good, it's also a curse because it means that we need to educate the market constantly and this is taking long time because we are a small company. But this work is being done systematically, uh, thanks partially to the sales team who is really doing a great work at uh, going to conferences and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and showing uh, the capability of our uh, instrument. And we are really uh, see that the uh, brand awareness for free cell and our instrument is increasing yep. year after year and we are really believe that we really have a potential to sell actually a lot of instruments which maybe hasn't been realized yet. No. But it's really due to the fact that we need to educate the market and sometimes go also against uh, um, marketing. Uh, yeah, just common belief. Um, or common beliefs, exactly. Uh, I mean, I think as well capturing, capturing the general idea in that it's um, uh, we have technologies, as as I think people might have grasped during some of the presentation, in that um, this is a little bit counterintuitive. You can actually work at the same size scale as biology. We're very used to working at our size scale. Um, and people are very used to how a typical lab has its uh, workflows. What we are presenting uh, is tools for improving that so much that it's kind of not really understood and accepted. So we do have to educate. But I would say in the last year, 
particularly after you know co after the COVID thing, um, we do get a lot more um, direct questions from from people and, and more interactions from uh, from people that yeah. are wanting collaborations and partners and things like that, um, uh, and equally from customers which are are, are like looking at oh this is something which we've never been able to do before. Um, the actual example that I showed um, uh, was uh, from Rockefeller University, and, and they were working on this particular project um, for malaria. They were studying malaria. And they worked on this project for multiple years, I, I think almost the entire PhD study of the student that was on it. Um, and then as soon as they kind of saw our technology, they were like, but this is, this is what I've been trying to do for years. Why don't we know about this? And this is kind of part of this, this answering to the questions it's taking time for us to you know educate people to the level of knowing it's there which is why both Tanya and and the the research team you know have this ongoing like we've got to get publications out we need to get this this better spread and and also we get to show some of our amazing discoveries and amazing work you know just through our website to show with white papers with application notes to better spread this word to spread this understanding and I think this is going to be the key once people believe this is truly possible and it's really some yeah. a capability that that they can have that it will start this penny will drop and they'll be like, oh okay then i can move forward and um and actually as nelson was showing we only have the top tier universities in our portfolio exactly that's what i was about to yeah. say and there's a reason why we yeah. have been uh, its key opinion leader yeah. has been adopting our instruments is because yeah. they had an understanding uh, about what they could yeah. use them for yeah. actually and we we hope this is going to keep spreading and rolling mm. but in recent our through our sales team and through our, our, our research team, um, we've now been expanding this to, to you know truly see. We now have more products out there which use similar physics, and I think this understanding of control of liquids at the size scale is now starting to become accepted by by the broader scientific community, and I think this will really start to drive uh, drive the, the sales. Yes, thank you. And to the next question, uh, in what way is your approach to make uh, longer hands islets different and or better than aspect by systems approach considering aspect <laughs> has already completed <laughs> in vivo point of care uh, or POC they have a substantial head start of approximately two years mm -hmm. yes that's a good question thank you well first of all we make artificial mm -hmm. islets we literally can choose what cells they will which which cells will constitute artificial islets in what proportion and then we literally print cell by cell making an islet and then we embed them in hydrogen layers to my knowledge uh, what aspect does they are using already pre-made islets mm -hmm. that are loaded into the uh, bio ink or scaffolding material and uh, it's even though we are aiming at tackling type 1 diabetes, these are rather two different approaches. And I just can tell that, I mean, the, the, the ability to manipulate cells with this high precision and literally uh, create uh, high precision islets that would allow us to um, avoid, for example, islet to islet variations known for, um, it's a known problem in transplantation of islands, so it would uh, allow us to create um, consistent and precise islets for uh, tackling the disease. So we're making them. Oh, okay, interesting. But it, uh, if I can just add add a little bit on to, to the end of that is uh, 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 everything uh, Tanya is saying is right on the money. Um, but also, um, uh, if we use uh, um only uh, use uh, islets which have been preformed. Um, we kind of get a little bit back to this issue of requiring donors um, uh, to to have pre-made islets. We generally need to have donors for the material to then put into the. When you're building them yourself, you can do it from the base principles. You can do it from the basic components um, to actually build them. Um, this also uh, has this idea of what Tanya has been able to demonstrate and what the research uh, guys have been able to show really well is. The composition uh, can be varied. Um, uh, we, as humans uh, at different part stages of life and everything else, have uh, different needs at different times. Um, uh, so uh, having just one uh, islet state uh, may not be ideal. There may be times when you need more insulin versus glucagon. There may be different uh, sizes, different maturities that are required. They may require different additive components. Uh, all of these things we have the ability to be able to do and tune on a per 
uh, patient, experiment per, yeah, per patient, patient basis. Yeah. Um, it doesn't need to be, uh, let's say, just acquired from donors. This can be tuned specifically for the patient or for the experimental needs. All right. Uh, how are your chances to secure funding that doesn't include rights issues? And do you have any timeline on when you think that you can be self-sufficient? But our chances to secure funding, which is not through capitalization, mm. through okay, uh, we have actually a good. I mean, if we have been listening to uh, to all the presentation, we have been explaining that there is really opportunities which we want to capture, and this is something we are working on. We want to uh, sign partnership or collaboration in order to be funded to continue mm. uh, this uh, development of either the therapeutic development or uh, yeah. to, uh, to have license agreements yeah. in order to be able to continue uh, the work on uh, tissue uh, models. Mm -hmm. And this is certainly a way of getting funded. Of course, it's also through the sales of instruments. That's the second uh, possibility uh, to get uh, revenue. And as we were explaining, we are dis diversifying constantly our uh, our product offering uh, to be able to uh, increase our different sources of revenue in uh, in the company. And of course, our goal is at some points to reach independence. Mm. Mm. And it's hard to tell when that point comes. I guess. It's hard to tell. We know <laughs> how much we need in revenue per month in order to achieve break-even. This is something that we know of. Uh, and to tell you exactly when this will be happening, that I cannot promise anything, of course, to the investor. But it's enough that we are getting, if it's not through sell, but through agreement, one very good deal that will actually put us in an independent uh, position uh, regarding the investor. Yeah, because just to build on it, I mean, we are uh, as Victoire showed at the start of the presentation, and people can can check, is that we're actually a very small company. Yes. Uh, we're we're not a. Um, if we look at a lot of the competitors, if we look at aspects which was raised earlier. I mean, a lot of these other companies are not two or three times, but they're five to ten, ten times, times. You know, our size. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, so that has uh, effect on our, 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 let's say, ability to um, uh, have a broader portfolio of things, but it also means that our we can control our financing a little bit easier and a little bit more um, uh, uh, agile, let's say, um, so that I think one sizable uh, deal pretty much uh, secures us for a long period. No, exactly. And it's sometimes, uh, maybe, maybe people or once sometimes forget that we are a very small size company because we do a lot of things. Mm. But we are only 20 people who are advancing mm. on all these areas which we have been explaining. And we are really working enormously and quite cost efficiently in order to develop everything we are doing uh, in the company. Yes. Uh, you have published a white paper regarding diabetes type 1 and your plan is to initiate a proof-of-concept proof study in 2024. Uh, how long does such a study take to carry out? All right, so our aim is to enter uh, in vivo preclinical study next year. And we aim to do it with our academic partner. So it, it's, I mean, to develop a therapy is a project and it takes years. So, uh, we would be happy to reach the next year goal and it will take us years to 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 complete uh, preclinical studies because it will go not only just uh, for in vivo investigations the w it will be followed by glp tox studies so it's it's a, it's a long journey mm. so we're entering just to the first stage of preclinical studies which are that yes. next year. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. next year and yeah. of course on the way we wish to attract partnership mm. because yes. we know that we cannot handle this yeah. development on our own mm. all the way uh, to uh, clinical mm. studies. And do you think that you can get early results from the studies? Yes, we're already going to get early results when mm. we start mm. to uh, to test in animal study. We will have a proof of concept absolutely with data and uh, that's also going to give us uh, 
uh, more that in order to be able to discuss with pharmaceutical industry in order to show them the, uh, the work we are doing, which doesn't mean that we are not doing it already. We are uh, already uh, showing what we are doing. We are already uh, showing the capabilities that Biopixlar is having. Uh, but we will have, of course, the more we are going into uh, the uh, pre uh, the preclinical uh, in vivo studies, the more we will be able to show that this is actually working mm. and the more we will be able to attract uh, collaboration of high uh, interest. Mm. So the outcome of our in vitro studies will be basis for our partnership conversations mm. with pharma. Yeah. yeah, all right. Um, in the Q1 report, you wrote, you wrote that you have managed to develop the company with controlled cost levels and that you will take measures to further improve cash flow. Can you mention some examples on the types of measures you intend to implement? So it's mostly as we are maturing as company, we have learned to, uh, to control our spending. Uh, we also are learning the more we are working with everything we are working on and between the different departments to really share cost and share, share materials and etc. We are really a company who I mean, we, we, we are extremely thankful from the investor. We invest into the company who believe in our project, and we are really a company who take the spending on this money at heart, and we are always very careful in what we are doing. We are careful in selecting the conferences of interest. We are not trying to over-travel, over overdoing things. At the same time, we are over-delivering with, uh, with the... Uh, the kind of cost-effective uh, spending uh, which we have. And we have a new CFO who is going to join us in uh, on the 1st of July. I've already have been uh, talking to mm. him. And this is going to be one of his mandates is to continue to identify where we can continue to be uh, cost-saving and at the same time going uh, being able to deliver all the promise we wish to deliver. Mm. Um, and question about um, insider ownerships. Uh, we received uh, a few questions on that. Uh, what are your comments on the alleged uh, low insider <coughs> ownership in the company? So that's indeed uh, a question that we are getting uh, constantly and which we are trying to address uh, all the time. We are getting this, uh, this, uh, this question and uh, so Every, all the senior management and the board of director, uh, the one who can, because I have to, to, to say that we have, for example, two board members who are not owning shares. It's not because by choice, it's because they cannot. One, it's because of being a lawyer in a, a company he, well, he, 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 he cannot. And the other one is being in the US. Uh, he had shares and he had to sell everything because there was no possibility to uh, keep on his share in Sweden for him, which is a very, um, I mean, a situation of banky day and person humor. So I'm not going to go into details. But basically, all the board members and uh, the senior management have been participi participating to every round. We all have been uh, putting our money into the company, maybe not as much as what the uh, shareholders would like to see. On a personal note, my husband and I, we have been investing several million in the company. So on our hand, we have the impression that we are uh, participating when it's required for us to participate, which is a, sh uh, a way uh, for us to show also that we support the company. And I think we see that we we are all extremely committed and we really believe uh, in the company. Otherwise, we wouldn't be there. Uh, so I would like maybe the shareholders uh, also to see that, is that we do believe in the company. We did do commit in, uh, in, uh, in uh, participating to all the rounds. For the option program, we are going to commit to, for example, uh, uh, convert our option to shares. Uh, this is, of course, something that we are going to all do. You want to add something, Gavin, as board no, members? I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I concur with your statement. I mean, it, it's uh, it's a very uh, it's 
let's say we've had some uh, unfortunate, as most of our investors can see, is that we've had a lot of unfortunate dips in, in, in our share price in, in recent years, um, which does affect the percentage you know, ownership uh, uh, quite significantly. Um, uh, uh, but as a, as a founder and board member, I mean, like a lot of us, including myself, I've um, invested in every round ever since the founding. Uh, uh, uh before we were public and and uh, and mm. forwards, so um, it's uh, I think the uh, of the unfortunate nature of our stock price being so low has made our our um, percentage ownership dwindle. Um, but it's not the belief, and it's not the let's say passion for continuity. Um, uh, it's it's more of a battle of numbers more than anything else. Yes, and uh, the board of director uh, also is initiating an incentive program mm. for uh, the uh, people in. Mm. Which is to buy shares. To buy shares, <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Um, that was the last question. Um, and with that, I would like to thank everyone who has been uh, with us today. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, Fluicell. And I wish you good luck in the future. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.